Take but nothing, leave but footprints. Short Pacific cruise. If you want to set out on the trade winds route to the South Pacific Islands like the Galapagos, the Marquesas, Tahiti or Bora Bora, you don't want to spend the next few years sailing the rest of the way around the world in order just to get back home. Fishing from a sailing boat rolling in the ocean swell is quite an exercise even on calm days. This magnificent mahi-mahi is only one of many that we caught. My crew, Alice and Menu, managed to supply us with fresh caught fish almost daily in the South Pacific. To land a medium-sized mahi-mahi takes two of us, with the risk of going overboard ever present. It's a golden rule in Bambola that we only fish when we need to eat and never for sport. Very strange bullheads. They really are the most beautiful golden fish with magnificent upper dorsal fin in rainbow colours. They swim in married pairs and frequently if we caught one, then another of the opposite sex would follow on to a line a few minutes later, before we had the chance to pull the other lines in. My crew Manu is a wonderful chef and the beautiful Mahi Mahi provided delicious meals for us all for the rest of the passage. And that was exactly what Captain Cook, William Bly, Robert Fitzroy, Captain of Darwin, Ship the Beagle, and countless others used to do all the time. They used this easy route, and because we now have the Panama Canal, it's a thousand times easier. For some reason, we seem to have forgotten all about this simple route, which has a following wind almost all the way. In its simplest form, you go through the Panama Canal in early December or Christmas, the canal has three locks joined together up to the big lakes. These you motor across and then you start the flight of three separate locks down to the Pacific. Alternatively, you could possibly ship your boat by road from East Coast USA to West Coast USA and from there head out to the Galapagos Islands. The idea that you cannot stop in the Galapagos Islands in a sailing boat these days is just plain wrong. You can stop, provided you have a visa for the boat, and it takes six weeks to three months to get one, depending on whether you use an agent to do it or you do it yourself. Having had a wonderful time in the Galapagos, you head out for the Marquesa Islands, which in my opinion are the most magical of the South Sea Islands. You visit the Tuamotu Islands, where the diving, if you're into that, is the best in the world. And then on to Tahiti and Bora Bora. There are the wonderful Cook Islands, and particularly the treasure island of Suvorov to visit. And all this is downwind. The trains will be blowing from astern, and the sailing is easy and gentle. When you begin your passage back towards the Atlantic Ocean, the ocean currents below the equator head east, and for many months the variable winds are around force five. As you can see on the pilot chart, as you head out towards the island-strewn South Pacifics, towards Pitcairn, Easter Island, and perhaps even Robinson Crusoe Island, which is close to the coast of Chile, on about the same latitude as Santiago. And from there, back north to Panama, or south to the Atlantic via the Straits of Magellan. Timing and preparation is of the utmost importance at both the start and the finish of this jaunt. Firstly, it's best to try to get to Panama before the Christmas winds set in. The passage from the ABC Islands is one of the roughest I've experienced and the strong winds set in around Christmas time. This was a shot on a calm day, sailing in company with my friends in Pax a few weeks after Christmas on our way to Panama. Now that there is an excellent marina in Cologne and the islands of San Blas are a lovely side visit, there's no reason why you shouldn't make these two places the jumping off point for your Pacific cruise. Okay, getting through the Canada Market now does take a little time and you need to book and wait for a slot to be allocated to you. I used the waiting time to get a ride in PAX first, just as a cameraman, and then went along with another boat as crew, so I understand how it all worked and the best way to look after my boat when I did it myself. And that's what most skippers do. The Cologne Yacht Club is very helpful with the extra long mooring lines you require and finding the obligatory four crew plus skipper for the canal transit. You can see my first transit on this video on my YouTube channel. Having got through the canal and maybe visited Panama City for stores and trade goods, 
horse saddles and tack and rucksacks are very sought after in the Pacific Islands, you can head out to the Ile de Rey Islands where you will discover the biggest manta rays you can imagine just cruising around your anchored boat. Then the Galapagos Islands are just ahead as you cross the equator. I'm very aware we're all on a sailing budget and to try to find the least expensive way to do things on our sailing adventures. The visit in the Galapagos is a very special experience, if only for the giant tortoise, which I enjoyed visiting in their reserve, and the marine iguana running up and down the local beach. Blue-footed boobies and the fact that Darwin got there before you and wrote a book about it. I loved my visit and it was one of the high points of my Pacific adventure. My visit is recorded in this video on my channel. The other reason not to bypass Galapagos is that the passage time from Panama or Rey Islands to the Marquesa Islands is going to become some five weeks non-stop at sea rather than six or eight days to the Galapagos past Dalrymple Rock. Having refueled and restocked it's then around 25 days to Nicohiva. Sailing into this Polynesian anchorage is quite magical and in the season it can also be quite crowded. Then sail on to the capital Hiva Oa where Paul Gauguin used to live and is buried and the Belgian singer Jacques Brel is also there. Both graves are almost side by side overlooking the sea and beautifully maintained by the local people. As you can see in my uh, video which is also on this channel, this one. After these islands you head out towards Tahiti via the Tuamotus where for the first time you encounter atolls and the learning skill of entering lagoons and finding a place to set the anchor where you'll not swing onto a coral head. The diving in the passes is just wonderful. Tahiti, Moria, Tioroa Atoll, that's the Marlon Brando luxury hotel resort of Vitiorara where a single room chalet costs $3,000 a night. I'm not sure if you're allowed to anchor there but uh, I have sailed past it. Bora Bora where Michener described as the most beautiful island in the world and if there's time to sail to Suvorov, the isolated Cook Island with its two park ranges and buried treasure then that's what you should do. You anchor up in its lagoon with perhaps only one or two other cruising boats as the only way to get there is by small boat. There's a video about that in my collection as well if you're interested called Treasure Island. There are a couple of full service full on marinas in Tahiti where you can either stay on board or leave your boat for a while and take one of the daily flights back to the USA from around $250. When you start to head east again towards the Caribbean or Atlantic Ocean, the first natural stop is Pitcairn where the lovesick Fletcher Christian and his motley crew and girlfriends ended up. There's a lot of surf on the landing place and the locals will normally ferry you in uh, for a fee, a not insubstantial fee. Further along to the east is Easter Island with its statues and is the furthest extremity of the Polynesian Empire proving that Thor Heyerdahl was absolutely wrong. It has okay anchorages just outside the little harbour and is a great place to visit. A friend of mine has uh, just left there. And then perhaps Robinson Crusoe Islands with its excellent anchorages, hotels and facilities. And these are just the high points. There are literally hundreds of islands along the route. Some you are prohibited from visiting, but a magic place to sail as you head home. Back to the beginning. No, this is not a cheap cruise because of the Panama Canal and Galapagos Island fees. But once you're past those two, the living is easy and the anchoring is free. And in my opinion, a total crew of four would probably be better than two sharing these expenses, although of course that depends on your experience and indeed your purse. The Panama Canal, which I've done three times, is quite demanding and has potential to damage your boat. It's going to cost around 1500 US dollars or 1200 UK pounds, plus the returnable deposit in case you damage part of the canal structure or need a tow because you've broken down. The visa for your boat to enter the Galapagos Islands is around 2000 US dollars or 1600 pounds, and you need to employ an agent to obtain it. Well, 
that's the best way. This is the charge for the boat. So if you split it four ways, around $500 each, it, it does seem more reasonable. This boat fee only permits a short visit of about a month and limits you to three anchorages within the island group. And on top of that, you have to pay to visit various resorts uh, in the same way as tourists do. You're allowed to stop at the islands in an emergency for 72 hours, but if you're caught sightseeing or exploring whilst you fix your boat, you'll be arrested and heavily fined, so calling an emergency without due cause is not to be recommended. The Galapagos authorities are very concerned about growth on your hull contaminating the pristine waters with foreign weeds, so you're obliged to have your hull cleaned in Panama and get a certificate to show that this has been done. You also need to have both black and grey water holding tanks, but the owner or skipper can self-certify that the boat has got these. There are a full raft of other rules and regulations to be obeyed, but with the help of an agent it's, it's pretty straightforward. For the chance of getting a sight of the blue-footed booby, a giant tortoise, a marine iguana on the beach, I don't think the hassle and cost is too much. I love my visit, and it was the perfect place to stock up for the longest ocean voyage you can make, which doesn't have the opportunity of stopping at land somewhere on the way. And that's the voyage between the Galapagos and the Marquesa Islands. As you pull into the first Marquesa Island of Nicohiva and drop the hook, it will be with almost a trace of sadness that the voyage is over. But you'll be welcomed by outrigger canoes, a charming friendly people, and the chance to visit the lovely fresh waterfall and have a swim. It's a charming place to swim and chill out away from the boats and the water is clear and pure as it runs down from the mountains. A chance to picnic, drink a little wine, eat some fresh boat-made bread in a place of pilgrimage for yachties who have not had anything but seawater to bathe in for the last weeks. The rest of the islands are just as enchanting and not to be rushed through. The Tuamotu Islands, which are all atolls for the most part, are next, and it's pleasant here to be anchoring in lagoons which are totally protected and have well-buoyed routes in and out. Finding the pass into the lagoons is not easy when the charts don't match the GPS positions, and even when you find them, the tides run in and out very fast indeed, making entrance or exiting challenging. Visiting the factory was a good experience. The cultured black pearls of the South Pacific are an institution. Lots of islanders are busy with this cottage industry, and a pearl selling for two or three dollars in Mahini will cost you ten times that in Tahiti, so it's a pretty profitable business. Early in life, the oysters are all joined together in long strings and put out into the lagoon to grow sufficiently big to receive the seeds that will eventually become pearls. Later, when they've grown sufficiently, they come ashore again and are opened up on these tables with wood pegs inserted to stop them closing again. The boxes of opened oysters are passed to the grafters. These are the high-talent, highly paid workers in the pearl industry. Of every hundred oysters implanted, 30 don't survive the procedure and 30 reject the nucleus. When harvesting time comes, of the remaining 40 oysters, only five will have produced perfect pearls. This partly explains the high prices, hundreds of dollars that are asked for black pearls in the tourist centres like Tahiti. Many of the islands, atolls, have airstrips and most are frequented by merchant ships from Tahiti and popular tourist resorts. Tahiti is the first civilised place you come to after leaving Panama, inasmuch as there are daily flights to the USA and cargo ships call regularly. There are chandlers, riggers, sailmakers and a couple of marinas and everything you need to repair your boat. Big markets and even dual carriageways. It's a fun place to be and all around Tahiti are islands to visit like Moria, Bora Bora and they are all frequented by cruise liners and are very commercial. Nonetheless, these are still nice places to visit. Having sailed the 600 odd miles from Bora Bora to the lagoon entrance of Suvorov, um, which is in fact about half a mile from its charted position, so you'll probably need to be pretty careful and try to approach it in calm weather, you can then head back towards Tahiti and prepare for your voyage back towards the South America. The 
ocean currents are favourable from this route but it's uh, not the trade wind route sailing that you've experienced up to now and so going to windward sometimes will raise its ugly head. The anchoring at Pitcairn in Botany Bay is pretty bumpy all the time as are some of the anchorages although cruise liners visit and land their customers successfully. Still to windward is Easter Island which 30 to 40 yachts visit each year. There's a small harbour which insists on you paying a pilot around $100 to get you in, or there are several anchorages. Depending on the wind, you can leave the boat fairly safely and go ashore to explore. Then, possibly on to Robinson Crusoe Island, which is a very commercial holiday resort, roughly on the same latitude as San Diego. It has excellent anchorages and is a popular sailing as well as tourist destination. It's also really the decision point as to how you get home. It's a three-day sail to Valparaiso in Chile where there is a yacht club and a marina. With the prevailing winds it would be possible to get back to Panama in about three to four weeks non-stop. But there are literally hundreds of anchorages and marinas all the way along this route. And when you get to Ecuador you might want to take a side tr trip and uh, visit Machu Picchu. I wish I'd done that. If you have decided to go through Panama again, you might want to stay on the Caribbean side when you get through the canal and head up towards Mexico to avoid bucking into the trade winds, which makes it a windward passage to all the islands. The real alternative is to head south to the Atlantic and cruise up the coasts of Argentina and Brazil back to the Caribbean or Europe. There is absolutely no need to go around Cape Horn, which even in local summer is uh, cold and windy. Joshua Slocum in Spray, the first person to sail single-handed all the way around the world, did go through the Straits of Magellan Islands and you can do exactly the same but in the opposite direction. This exciting alternative is perhaps 10 days sail away from Robinson Crusoe and Easter Islands depending on weather. It'll be getting colder all the time but not freezing if you arrive in December, their summer, and when a max of uh, 14 degrees is possible at midday but by evening they do drop to, um, it does drop to around 7 degrees centigrade. The western entrance to the Straits from the Pacific is wide and clearly marked as is the entire route through the Straits to the Atlantic. Once you're in the Straits it's probably a couple of weeks with stops and of course you'll need to park up each night. The route is not desperately complicated and there are plenty of anchorages, buoys, ports and stopping places and it's well marked and is still used by many small merchant ships. After a couple of weeks you pop out almost opposite the Falklands and then head back north to the Caribbean or the Med via the Canary Islands and you've done it all in just over 11 months, 12 months. The cruise of a lifetime in my opinion I'm just surprised more people don't think about doing it. Fair winds. My library of digital sailing books is at gentlesailing.com so you can buy them as instant downloads. There's a link to a printer who can convert them to hard copy if that's what you prefer. I've just totally updated and republished French Canal Routes to the Mediterranean which is now in its 12th edition and is fully up to date with new information, charts and pictures. Recently I published Your Boat in the Sun which proved an instant popular success. It's about where to keep your boat in the Mediterranean or the Caribbean and the costs and the logistics involved. I sold 50 copies on the very first day. The Atlantic Crossing Guide has become a bestseller and it outsells most of the others, probably because it's arguably one of the most comprehensive guides to sailing to the Caribbean that's available. The Gentle Sailing Route to the Mediterranean is one of the most popular publications that I have. It describes how to coast hop all the way to Gibraltar without having to spend a night at sea. There are books about marinas in the Med, sailing in the Caribbean islands, as well as a book on simple navigation and even a Pacific Ocean crossing guide um, and a book about just living aboard a sailing boat. Anyway, it's all at gentlesailing.com so please do pay the site a visit and browse through my publications if you have a moment. Thanks. 
Fair winds.